what it did, it took a, a quiet, serene setting and made it into something that happened almost as if you threw pixie dust on us and then it broke up. And away it went, and here we are. Now we're down in the stadium. We got a tournament happening. Where did this come from? It's hard to describe it, you know, it, because it just started out as kind of a, a basic little community thing where really the Richmond and Steveston guys, they wanted a chance to play each other again. They wanted to keep that rivalry going. Here we go, Steveston and Richmond. It has that feel to it that it always will spark a fond memory. And that's an important thing in life. You know, you have those memories and then you flash back to the 84 championship or you flash back to the final of one Dolphin Park or one year that you had lost or, or just one great time you had had. Sarah, you tournament organizer, come over here for a quick interview. For us, uh, we knew that if we didn't do it, we probably wouldn't, we'd probably all go our separate ways. And so this tournament is more than just basketball. It's kept our friendship close and alive all those years. 27 years is like two lifetimes. Like a lot of things have changed, but uh, you know, the one constant is, is Dolphin. You know, that's a very good question. How has Dolphin affected me? Fortunately, we only have a few minutes, but I'll try to make a synopsis for you. Yes, it's had that much impact on my life. It's, it's actually allowed me to be who I am today. I haven't had a job longer, I haven't been in a relationship longer, didn't go to school longer. You know, the only thing I've had longer than all this is, is the friends that I do this tournament with. There's a lot of love at this park. Life would be completely, completely different if this court wasn't here. Like, you know, this this kind of gave us a, a taste of what could be. And there's the silverware. Quite honestly, it was one of my early, earliest goals I had ever set. If you want to be the man, I mean, you, you just take a look and you're like, okay, I, I got to beat those guys. I got to play against those guys and I got to beat them and I got to win this tournament. So I think it drives people to come want to play in this tournament just based on the fact that all the great players that have played in the past. When I had set that goal to be part of Dolphin, it just sort of stuck with me like, hey, this is, this is my goal and this is what I gotta do. I've been playing since I was in grade 12 and have never won a Dolphin title. It'll be exciting basketball in the sun, 23 degrees at court level, out of doors, and we hope you'll sit back and watch Dolphin Park basketball. the crown jewel in the mouth of the Fraser River at its delta. Richmond has a tremendous tradition in terms of uh, community involvement. High school basketball is a very, very important part of it and it's part of that same enthusiasm. Well, in 1984, we had three high schools in Richmond. Richmond High being the oldest, it's been around for over 75 years. Steveson started in the late 50s, I like think 58, and McNair came on the scene in 73. And it wasn't until Kent Chapel at Steveson and Bill Disbro came to uh, Richmond High that the programs at the high school started to go to another level. Basketball in Richmond uh, became uh, legendary. I think the uh, high school basketball scene in Richmond in the 80s was uh, something that we haven't seen since that I'm not sure about before, but it was, a, it was an amazingly electric scene. It was some of the best basketball in BC at that time. In the 80s, both Richmond and uh, Stevenson were in the top 10 almost every year. There was a great, intense rivalry between Stevenson High and Richmond High. Richmond Stevenson, as I mentioned earlier, is the best rivalry in the province. Game nights with on um, the Stevenson games were truly incredible. I mean, I can remember back when I was in high school, and I remember coming out and watching the Richmond Stevenson rivalry, you know, having to line up hours before just to get in to see the game. 
Well, there we can see some of this large crowd. When I say large, it could be larger, but they couldn't fit anyone else into this gymnasium or the fire marshal would be here. We were excited about maybe one day going to Steveson and playing for Steveson. We all thought, wow, you know, that's like the holy grail of uh, basketball. We were young guys balling all the time, um, everywhere we could, anytime we could. Um, we were just real street ballers and rat ballers. We went from gym to gym and outdoor court to outdoor court. And I think Bira probably found this location. I think he was looking for a car in the neighborhood, looking to buy a car. And he saw this oasis in a neighborhood. We came out looking in this way, and as we're test driving it, uh, I totally lost clue of the car, couldn't care less. And when I saw this court, and I'm like, what, there's a court? Hoops are up, backboards, and nobody's playing on them? We could come here, we could play, and uh, we could hang out all day long or all evening long until it was dark, and we would literally play until it was dark. And so we kind of made it our home. Word of mouth spread. It was like wildfire. And then it's like, oh, we found the court. It's by Dolphin. And, you know, we're all like pretty excited about it, right? And so we started coming here, just a small group. And then, you know, like I said, everybody started talking to each other. The different schools started talking. And next thing you know, it's like it was the, the hub of uh, summer basketball here. So the people in the park were uh, getting a lot of exercise, so they'd quite often be thirsty. and they'd they'd come along and knock on our door and ask if they'd get some water. And, and we just told everybody, anytime you want water, you don't have to ask, just come and turn it on. So for all those years, we'd hear the tap run outside every once in a while and have a peek and somebody's getting their water on it. What this did, these pickup games, it allowed uh, kids from, you know, other schools like McNair, Steveson, Richmond, all coming together and playing there. So it came basketball season, we kind of knew each other a little bit. But we still kept our distance because we kept, we were still rivals. In 1984, we were both very strong. For the 84, we thought we had the athletes and the ability to uh, definitely go to the provincials. This team that we had going into the 83, 84 season was going to be something special. I, I kind of knew that, and we all knew that. It was going to be probably the peak point of Richmond and Steveson rivalry that year. We met that year more than we ever had before, just because we kind of follow the same path. Once in a while, stick it to them hard, and then another time back off, then they don't know what to expect. Nice move. Oh, nice play by Stanton. All the hard work that we had put in was paying off. Bindra is red hot. He said about five in a row. I don't think he's missed this half. Slowly and surely, we, uh, through the season, just sort of peaked and peaked and peaked. And our reward was that we made the provincials. Provincials is a tough, grueling tournament. We had three hard-fought games, you know, during that week, and uh, then we made the final. So did Richmond. You, you couldn't write it any better. By the time that the week had gone by and we were ready for the championship game, uh, we didn't think we could lose. And they sold out all the tickets to the Agridome by noon today in, in Richmond at Lansdowne uh, Shopping Center. They're so strong, they're so, they're so big. Um, they're playing extremely well. We're going to have to really come up with a, with a good game if we're going to keep our streak alive. Don't go away. The first quarter tip pot comes your way right after this. Welcome back to the p &E grounds, the Agrodome, the site of the 1984 High School Basketball Championship. It's the Richmond Colts and the Steeston Packers. It's an all-Richmond final. It was the biggest crowd ever for the BCs in the, in the Agrodome. They just said, we're not going to kick anybody. We're just going to let everybody come in. who had yet to win their first ever provincial crown, both from Lulu Island, continuing one of the best high school athletic rivalries in the D.C. 
During the regular season series, Stevenson had taken three of four games, but the clubs had never met for all the marbles. In that game, we dictated pressure. We, you know, we dictated the, the tempo and, uh, and the physicality of it. And, and I think that's why we won. We not only won, but won by a large margin. And the game is over. The Steichen Packers have won the 1984 championship. The Packers, the champions of British Columbia. Even when the final whistle blew and the crowd came storming onto the court, I still was like, this is really happening? <laughs> That's what uh, happens when teams uh, win championships, you know? It brings, uh, it brings a group of people together for a lo long, long time. So you hope that the players love the game enough that they'll continue to play for the love of the game. And the one thing about this group is almost all of them continue to play. And of course, Dolphin Park became a huge part of that continuation of playing. It, it ended so well, and I think it in a way created a, a momentum. And I think that was probably the spark that ignited these kinds of thoughts and, and future visions. Say, so, hey, you know what? That was a good ride, but that ride should not be over. You know, we just kind of thought about, hey, why don't we do a tournament? Just to have an official tournament where someone would get crowned, you know, the, the champs for the summer. It wasn't even about uh, reliving the past or anything like that. It was just for the moment. And this was the perfect venue. This was our vision. At the time when the courts were all built, specifics and dimensions weren't, uh, how do you say, up in the forefront. It, it was made right. It, it's um, a little bit shorter than, uh, than a regulation court and, a, and not as wide as a regulation court. So you can only play four on four to affect the game. Five on five would be too many bodies uh, on the surface. So in 1986, the summer after he graduated, was the inception of Dolphin Park Classic. It was the very first Dolphin Park. We kept it very basic the first year. I think it was one day and won a case of beer if you won the tournament. Well, you know, we made some t-shirts. We just grabbed some on sale and took them in my backyard. And Garth Robertson was, uh, he knew some, uh, he had some background in graphics and design, I guess. They're pretty funny. It's got the first annual Dolphin Classic. And I always laughed, I said, how can it be classic if it's the first one, right? But you know, what, we were like 18, 19 years old at the time. Ah, it's great, you know? <laughs> this little park was the ideal size to have a tournament in. There would just be such a great atmosphere that just sprang up. It was a real street ball tournament. It was, um, you know, with all the houses all around, there's no main road. It was, um, it was like in your backyard. That's, how, that's what the feeling was. That's what gave it that um, very small town feel, but it had that festival atmosphere as well. I think Dolphin's a very unique event, and I think that helped it early on. Because there was nothing else really like it. And because of the popularity of basketball in the city of Richmond was huge, you know, I mean, it was at its peak in that sort of, I would say, you know, mid to late 80s and early 90s. When the tournament first began, we only had one rule, and that was to have only Richmond residents play in the tournament. We wanted to do it for our own community. And if we opened it up and had no restrictions, that would, that would eliminate all the people that we're doing it for. To keep it original in term, it only heightened the competition. It only heightened the old feelings. It only heightened the, the excitement of the product was on the court. And the community at large in Richmond bought into it. These are the same kids that had families and parents that would support and watch them play everywhere. Without that support, we wouldn't have had this huge foundation. And that really, really was our platform. But all of a sudden, people were coming to us and people were contacting us and we were making new friends and meeting guys from, from far and wide, really. And uh, that's how the tournament really started to grow. And everybody started to put it on their calendar. When you have players calling your house asking when the date is because they have to set their wedding, wedding date, you know it's still popular. <laughs> It went very quickly from a one-day event to a two-day event 
to a two and a half day event. When it becomes successful, what does it do? It draws the better players. And I think, I don't know whether the committee um, for Dolphin Park realized that success was gonna change the level of the competition. And we started to attract uh, players, more and more players from, from outside of the Richmond City borders. And the competition was growing each and every summer. We had to expand because there was a huge demand. We had a list of so many talented players outside of Richmond that wanted to play and we just couldn't fit them in initially. Then we introduced what we called the import rule, which meant you could have one player from outside of Richmond. To introduce the import rule, we did with some caution, because now you're opening up something for our community that invites something bigger, larger than the community itself. But it was embraced very, very favorably. It not only opened up the doors for a higher caliber athlete to to augment the local Richmond talent. It opened up the door for bigger support outside of the town of Richmond. Thanks again for supporting Dolphin Park and a great, great many thanks to the scorekeepers and the entire Dolphin staff. Thank you very, very much. I think it spawned tremendous enthusiasm in the community, and I think it really motivated a lot of young kids, you know, who might at that time may have chosen another sport to play. But here they saw this great showcase event, and they'd heard of these players, and it was so high profile that, you know, I, I guarantee you there's some kids that saw that when they were 12 or 13, you know, who ended up playing in it, you know, five, six years later because they were so excited about it. I guarantee you that. It's intimate. It's... And it's, it's sacred. You, you just grew up with that. This was the place where everybody played. And you wanted to be part of that place where everybody played. I think it was about grade, probably about grade seven, grade eight, when I first found it. It was kind of like if you get to play a dolphin, it was kind of like you're, the, you're one of the in guys in the basketball community. So it was, yeah, it was definitely a goal when I was in high school, when I realized you know, I could, I could go on to college and do stuff like that. And it was kind of like, let's play dolphin first. And I mean, that's when you could find out like, how good you are, I think. And then one day I was down here shooting around and these guys rolled up and I was like, hey, uh, I'm playing basketball. They said, no, you can't. Why? Oh, because we're having a tournament here. Oh, I still want to play. No, you can't, this is a tournament. Okay, so. Uh, you know, I, I sat on the side and I'm quite sure I end up scorekeeping or watching for the rest of the day and then I just kept coming by and, uh, you know, the rest of the day and the rest of the weekend and just hanging out because I enjoyed watching basketball and, you know, I sort of knew these faces uh, from the community growing up but I didn't really know who everybody was and then uh, just kept coming back year after year and, you know, kept coming to the park, you know, day after day and uh, you just sort of make that connection with people. Having older kind of mentors be there in a basketball sense for, for our community was, I think it's very important. It's two nice points. There was always guys ahead of you who you kind of looked up to, who you always wanted to play against. You rarely got the chance, sometimes you did. You could see where you hoped to go and it kind of helped set goals because you had these kind of tangible people in front of you. It was big to just be able to play against those guys who you, you read about in the papers and you know you saw on Shaw TV or whatever it was at the time. So all the kids came out to watch and, uh, and we want them to be inspired to play. You learn how to act, you learn how to compete, you learn you know, how, to be, uh, how to carry yourself on a basketball court. There'd probably be a row of kids drinking Danny Slurpees watching, you know what I mean? And just spending the whole day there watching and learning. If you want to keep this thing going, you have to have the younger kids buy into it and be part of this. Thing. You can't just shut them off and hope, hopefully that they'll catch on and, and, and help out later when they're old enough. No, and, and they showed the interest. They showed the passion. And how could you deny someone like that? A lot of our best players that ever came out of there were scorekeepers there. Oh my. Lucky myself and a few other buddies, we'd be scorekeeping uh, the Dolphin Park tournament and just having a blast doing it because it's basically front row seats to see, you know, what we thought was the best basketball ever. Um, but yeah, just to sit in the scorer's table and, you know, you have all these grown men shouting at you, flip the score, what's the time? Just getting all over you and you're this little kid. 
you're just so happy eating your free burger and your drink. We used to get a, a pop and a hot dog and a t-shirt if we worked the score, a scoreboard. So, and back then, you know, I, I, I was at the tournament line, uh, a few months ago and it was, uh, you know, the digital scorecards. Well, we used to flip the cards and uh, actually that was the, the first thing was the, the chalkboard. So we would have chalkboard, it would either be me and Novell standing on one side, Lucky would be doing the, the score. We'd, all, we'd be doing something, either score, uh, you get the referee's water, whatever we did. We, you know, you just wanted to be involved as a kid. There are the scorekeepers. Oh. They've done a great job, but if I keep getting the camera on them, they're gonna miss some uh, points. You know, I did days where, I think I did every game. You know, we sat there all day, and uh, you know, time would just fly by. You know, 9 a.m., wondering what these guys, why they got, why the, why do some of them have a headache? Why yeah. they look like they haven't slept all night? You realize it when you get older <laughs> that they're out partying the night before. But, uh, you know, you're so innocent, you don't realize it. And so when you're that young, um, you know, you see your buddies in the stands, you, you're the same age, and they're watching you score keep, and you're like, you're proud, right? You're like, hey, I'm here. Like, again, eating your burger and getting shouted at from all directions from the different guys, but that was as close as you could get to being on the court at the time. And then ultimately, we always envisioned ourselves being on the court. And as I grew older and watching the tournament, it was one of those things where it's like, this is where the best play. And everybody at that time, you wanted to be amongst the best. We were seeing that we had some staying power. And, uh, and we were building uh, another group of players that was gonna carry the, the tournament forward. As I grew older um, and, and wanted to play in the tournament more, finally got to play in the tournament, it was like, you know, it's like going out on your first date. Yeah, when you get that call, it's kind of like, all right, I've kind of made it, I'm, I'm known now, or whatever you might say, like I'm good in basketball in Richmond for sure. And I remember my first tournament, uh, the team that I was playing for, they picked me up and I was really excited to be here. I didn't play that much. Came back the next day though, still wanted to play. It was great. You're out there with these grown men who were, you know, twice as strong as you, just had that old man strength and bullied you, sweat more than you did. You know, but when you did get on the court, it was, you know, it was nerve wracking, right? Um, you know, you're playing against, you know, college players or, um, you know, at that time, I was playing against, yeah, other high school guys who just graduated from high school, right? So, you know, five years older, six years older. And, um, you know, I just remember being nervous. Yeah. So my first year wasn't personally a success, but I enjoyed being part of the basketball community, the environment, the park, the, you know, the flavor of the tournament. And as the years progressed, as the tournament built, so did my playing time, so did the enjoyment of everything, because you just, you got involved more. It was terrific to, and fantastic just to see um, the younger guys um, sort of take ownership of the event and uh, become part of the event. And we're just looking at these kids going, wow, like, you know, how many years have we been doing this? And then when the second generation started playing, we hope it would just keep the tournament going. We never envisioned it would take it to levels far exceeding what we expected. Good afternoon and welcome to Dolphin Park in Richmond. I'm Bill McNulty, your host, and we're covering the Dolphin Park Invitational. Yes, it's the sixth annual Invitational Basketball Tournament played here at Dolphin Park out of doors on concrete and asphalt. <laughs> The environment here was incredible. Uh, you would come here and like I said, instead of having bikes, you would have cars and the, the field over there would be littered with cars. The blocks here would be littered with cars. It was like a, a basketball utopia. You know, it was like, it's a perfect world, right? The next step in the horizon that we saw was um, when we see indications of it bursting at the seams. So we have to let some air out and change some rules to accommodate the tournament. We want uh, to involve as many people as we can. And we thought, you know what, we're just gonna, um, for lack of a better word, just open it up. There is no import rule. And all of a sudden, there was an influx of teams, there was an influx of talent, and there was an influx of people watching this tournament and, just, and it grew. When the tournament was growing the way it was, it was, it was feeling really good, but at the same time, 
you didn't know from year to year how it was, how it was going to be. I think that was a thrill of it. We didn't know what we were going to get. Looking here now, we have the Express in the light. And blue dirty pigs in the turquoise. We went to another level that we didn't know that existed every year. In the 90s, when it was just growing in leaps and bounds, we still set up the same way. We still brought up my old pickup truck, Beer's old pickup truck, and we still humped the ice in. We still dragged the bleachers around, moved the porta potties around, set the park up use all our kids' helps, everything. So that part never changed. There was nothing in the Lower Mainland or even in the immediate area that was like it. I think in all of Canada back then, you didn't have these crazy outdoor tournaments with beer gardens and music and such a social atmosphere. It was kind of the Richmond Woodstock back in the day. It was, it was just incredible. The scent of the park changes. You know, you can smell Hawaiian tropic lotion out there. You, you see different colors, you know, the, uh, the bright pinks, the, uh, the lime green stuff. You know, and that includes some of the referee uniforms. Um, but it's all very, you know, in, in a word, it's very colorful. There was people dancing. There was people like, they would form a dance floor in the beer garden. Like, so you got guys and girls grinding up on one each, each other on one side. And then you got like grandparents sitting and people in the bleachers would always, you know, they would make room in the front row and let the grandparents sit there. Everyone just coexisted really nicely. It was a real community vibe. God, I don't think it ever rained one summer all through those years. There was so much luck involved with it as well. And uh, we just had one great basketball weekend after another through all those years. We didn't know where the peak was. We, we really didn't. It's just a natural thing, well, it's gotta end somewhere. It's gotta end somewhere. But every year we just said, how do we better the next year? And for like a 10, 12 year span, it just kept getting better. It's like, you're, you're almost in a dream. And it's like, well, you gotta wake up sooner or later. It's gotta come to an end, but it just didn't. Everybody in Seattle was talking about it. It's big up there as well. I just wanted to come watch. That was my initial reaction, and I just wanted to be a part of it. Okay, now how have you enjoyed playing it so far? It's your first time? Oh, it's great. The fans out here really support their teams, and to get a turnout like this, you know what I mean? It's a lot of fun. Okay. Uh, what do you think about the kind of game that you guys are playing up here? Four and four is a little different. It's definitely different, but it's more space. I mean, it's a smaller court, but you have more space to do your thing. And I mean, it's just great. The atmosphere here, and I mean, they really get into it. So it's a lot of fun here. I think the biggest years at the Dolphin Park Tournament were the years when the really good Seattle teams came up. Initially, it was a contact I had. Uh, one of my friends through work was dating this, uh, this guy named uh, Al Foster Garrett, who just goes by AG. AG, it turns out, was a good baller, and we were talking, and I said, AG, we don't want to play in the tournament. So uh, he came up solo one year, and he loved it. And what he said to me was, uh, best little tournament west of the Mississippi. That's what he said about Dolphin. So he said, can I bring a team up? And we said, sure. The first year that we had a full team from Seattle come, it catapulted to a whole new universe. And then how it even grew beyond that, it actually grew much to our benefit, is one of the people he brought up was Ed Haskins. Ed turned out to be just like AG, a natural organizer, a natural coach, a natural captain. And Ed, in his big way, changed Dolphin forever. He started bringing up um, these amazing American players. They came up with, with that mentality that they wanted to win this tournament. And I think that's what made this tournament great. And there was an excitement in the air. There was just this, like, 
like keep the buzz around the park. Like, man, when, when are the Americans playing? When are the Americans playing? You know, that sort of thing and stuff like that. It's good that the, the Seattle guys came because it, it pushed everybody to take up their game another notch. The cool thing and the really uh, great thing about having all of a sudden all this American content was um, some natural rivalry built up. What became a bigger rivalry was Canada and the U.S. So Stephen Richmond was replaced by Canada versus U.S. Just like to let everyone know, 19 years. It took 19 years for somebody south of the border to take our hardware. That was probably the, one of the last things that really helped us get to the very peak of the tournament, which was I thought was in 2005. You know, I have many friends who live in Richmond, and I've, you know, been really uh, wanting to come back since then, so I'm glad I could be here this year. It was something you'd see in a music video. It was like a Naughty by Nature video. Nothing we ever planned for, nothing we ever anticipated. We never dreamed. We, were, we weren't really, uh, we're dreamers, but we weren't uh, hoping and dreaming for any of this. It just sort of naturally um, grew and happened. During those pinnacle era, the walk around the park, just to watch, amazing. It, it's just, it's euphoric. It's an out of body experience, really, it, it is. It feels a lot similar to winning the provincial championships because the sense of, you know, you, you worked so so many years to get to that point and 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 everything comes together for that one time and and, and the sense of accomplishment, and that's what Dolphin Dolphin was like. It was actually something that we we actually stepped back a couple of times, going, oh my, you know, my goodness, what's going on? Like, why is there so many people here, right? And for the first uh, time in forever, they had to have a police presence in the park because of crowd control. Logistically, we had to basically shut down the whole neighborhood. You have to understand it's a neighborhood park. It's uh, proximity to the neighbors and its physical dimensions are a barrier for growth. And you're kind of like, can this park maintain? Can this park hold it? I knew in the back of my mind that this couldn't continue. As much as we don't want to think that it has to come to an end in this park. It's a reality. The exact words from the city was that you guys are too successful for your own good. And, and that's what happened to us there. The tournament got too big, too big a crowd, and that they thought it's not safe to be at that park anymore. You physically cannot have that many bodies in that small amount of geography in real estate. You can't. And so we had to look at other options. To be told that you have to move it, you know, it's kind of heartbreaking, kind of frustrating. I could only imagine for, for Bruce and Tony and TJ and Vera. We fought it. We fought it hard. We didn't want to move. I mean, this is this was our holy grail. When we first were um, asked to move the tournament out of Dolphin, you know, we were kind of like, Slightly thinking, you know what, it's not going to be the same. You know, it's going to be completely different. The, the, the whole reason why Dolphin is the way it is is because of the location, you know, and the neighborhood feeling to it, of, of it. And, um, you know, it was, it was really hard for us, like, you know, and then, and then reality sets in, you have to do it. They really wanted and recommended that we move to uh, a community center. And so the community center that was identified by, by the, the city folks, the RCMP, and, and ourselves as an organizing committee was Thompson Community Center. Well, I guess from the start, it was like, wow, really? We can bring Dolphin here? It was an opportunity to bring um, a really high caliber of basketball, a caliber that most of us never get to see, onto courts that is in, it's in our neighborhoods. It's not surprising that the, the organizers uh, for altruistic reasons feel strongly that they want to keep this tradition alive. It's a grassroots organization and that's the way it has stayed and the people who are involved take a very, very personal interest in it. Any year they could have been like, you know what, forget this, I ain't doing this anymore. But they continued because it's, it's become a part of everyone's lives. The transition was very emotional, very hard. But we knew if we wanted to go to the next level, we had to do it. 
moving to Thompson, you know, there's a lot of good things came out of it too. The biggest of all, it was the second court that allowed us to have a women's division. And we always wanted that, even the old Dolphin. When we moved over to Thompson Park, I thought, this is great, you know, there's two courts. There's a potential to get two courts running and have more people involved. And even if the women aren't on the main court, there's gonna be people that are gonna be watching their game, taking notice about how good these women are. It is about community. It's about a basketball community. And now we're building a new community with those community of women players too. I really would like to see the young girls kind of believe they can do something like that. Because that's what I saw when I was a young kid, that I would be playing in that event. I didn't know how it was going to happen, but I saw myself playing there. So ideally, I hope that's what those young girls are thinking. And I hope in years to come, we're going to still be having a competitive women's division. For them to not give up uh, you know, the fight to not only just to keep it here, but also uh, not give up the desire to want to run it at another uh, location, uh, was, it was special, it was pretty honorable. We thought of it as a challenge. We thought of it as doing something different. We thought of it, again, going back to that word, um, we've built up a legacy. We've got something um, that, that really is strong and has continued to be strong. Um, let's try to do it again. Let's try to continue and build the legacy. Check, 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 check. Good morning. All right. It would mean a lot to me to finally win Dolphin um, because I played here so much, because I've played in the, in the tournament so much, because I've been around the tournament so much. The unique thing about playing in Dolphin is it's an, as much as it's a basketball tournament, it's an endurance to the end. Whose body can last playing seven games on concrete? I've been playing since I was in grade 12 and have never won a Dolphin title. People don't come out here to play and go, yeah, I won this prize at Dolphin, I won that prize. There's no money, there's no, it's, it's pride. It's competing for the sense of, of pride and holding that I've won a Dolphin championship. Coming up, it's the Running Rebels taking on the next Falcons. Hard work on both ends of court. Hey, good job, Rebels on three, one, two, go. Oh.
There is another one in the books. The running route upsetting the X Falcons by 15. 81 66. Steve Lee, really happy right now. You can't tell, but he is really happy. When I see someone who cares that much about Dolphin, and uh, for them, it's a huge part of their uh, athletic lives and just their lives in general. Like, that's, I find that wonderful. And it uh, means a lot to me and, and everybody else that that's how much um, the people that we're involved with, that's how much uh, pride they take in Dolphin. And that's how much they care about it. He's been chasing that championship for 20 years, so it would definitely mean a lot to him. I mean, you know, at his, at his age, to be a crucial part of that team, that window is closing really fast. If I don't win it, does it, you know, mark who, uh, you know, my, my career at Dolphin? Yeah, a little bit. If I do win it, does it sort of, is that that cap on it? For sure. Stick around, folks. Don't go nowhere. This is the final, the championship. Last game was the evening. The beer garden is still rocking. Concession stand is open. He's been so close he can taste it, so close. And this would actually put him in the fraternity that he really deserves to be in. For Steve Lee to win the Dolphin Championship, it would mean a lot to Steve Lee. And it also would mean a lot to Dolphin. He, he's like a, a member of the family. We've got a five-point game right now. Run the Pebbles is enjoying the lead. All right, here we go. Seven and a half minutes to go in the men's final. Running Rebels up by six right now, 49-55. Running Rebels looking like they're going to be taking the title right now. That's the ball game, ladies and gentlemen. Eight-point victory for the Running Rebels. They are the 2012 27th Annual Dolphin Classic Champions. I've been playing since 94, so that's a long time. I'd like to go on high note, but I'll probably be back. Everybody's created this environment to be something special for basketball. And, uh, you know, it'd be, it'd be a shame to see you know, the one day that it stops, because hopefully it doesn't, and hopefully the next generation continues it on and uh, realizes that, you know, 28 years ago that, you know, something special was started in the community and uh, it should continue. Oh, can I get the dunk champion out here? The dunk champion, Clayton. Is Clayton around somewhere? There he is. Come out here. Come get your money. And where's the three-point champion? Is Aki Godola here somewhere? I think the Dolphins gonna go on and on and on for a long time. And maybe even a lot longer than any of these guys. You know, when they decide they need a break or step down, somebody else is gonna step in, I think. I really think that, so, you know? I think it's just too good of a thing. It's fun making Dolphin, and it's uh, super rewarding to do it for other people and uh, give them that opportunity to, to play basketball. All these years, I've been looking for a reason not to do it because it's easy to find reasons to do it for me, and uh, I just haven't haven't got one. So, just for it to continue to grow, but not the size of it, but just grow through the generations of kids coming up, and for them to understand, you know, have an idea of what what it was and what it is. Yeah, just for it to continue, you know, that's my only hope. To me, that would be the ultimate legacy. Once we're gone, this term is still going on. Yeah. If Dolphin Park wasn't around, gosh, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> um,
play it as well. And exactly. Uh, and there's two. Oh. Oh. Oh.